messages. And the message is that the audio on this conference today will be broadcast on uh, suncoastbible.com. Okay, and, and there'll be in other places too on YouTube and so forth. <coughs> it's good to get that information out. Uh, how y'all doing? Great. You doing all right? Doing great. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you today about the hope of your calling. And the hope of your calling uh, is an important issue in the grace life. It's an important issue in all the lives of saved people. And uh, it's important because the hope of our calling doesn't leave us hanging. We have hope. And that's what we need. So it's interesting uh, when you look at these things, uh, turn your Bibles, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Um, there's, there's a lot going on in the world today. As a matter of fact, we're kind of going through a tumult tumultuous situation here in our country and uh, in other places around the world. And, and these things go up and they spike that way and then they go down and they, they level off. And uh, you, you look at the whole thing, though, in, in a bigger way, you realize that we don't have to worry about anything at all when we're in Christ. And so the gift of righteousness uh, is part of this because we know, and I, I've been using this for years, <coughs> and uh, Brother Rick turned me on to this in his uh, programs, and the man's, the, the man's problem today, man's problem is what? What's, what's the worst thing? Sin, death, and judgment. And if you're not saved, and you don't believe that Christ died for your sins, you're going to die in your sins. And you can't get that back. And it doesn't matter whether it's family, or just somebody on television, or somebody that you might know. The gift of righteousness allows you to understand that there is a solution to this. And the solution is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the solution. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, and go to verse 18. And let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your, for your word, and we thank you for the fellowship here to this weekend. And uh, we thank you for all the many blessings that we have in Christ. And uh, we thank you for it today. Amen. Okay. Uh, we're going to chop through some of these things, and, and uh, I'll try to keep it easy to understand. But uh, in... in Ephesians here in 1, verse 18, he says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So there is understanding. There is enlightenment. How do you do it? How do you get it? You study. You read the Bible. The people in the world today are not reading their Bibles. And they're not doing that because they don't like to read or anything like that. It's what it is is they're reading something that's not really true in this dispensation of grace. There's a lot of things that have already come, and there's a lot of things that, that are still to come. But right now, in the dispensation of the grace of God, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. If you could solve that problem, and it's not solvable, it's always coming back. And when you hear what they're doing in the Middle East and doing those things over there, you wonder, how is it that they don't understand these things? Well, it's because they don't know their apostle. They don't know who Paul was. And so the eyes of your understanding is very important. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. The hope of his calling is the hope of our calling. We're connected with it. And 
it says, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints as what and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his <clears throat> mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, he's talking about the body of Christ, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. It's a wonderful thing. It's fantastic. It's, it's amazing that people don't get this. I, you know, it's, it's strange, but it does happen. The hope of our calling, and he talks about this in verse, go down to um, four, chapter 4, and, and notice what he says here. He, he's, he's given you quite a bit in the first three chapters, and now he's going to give you some new material and in, in uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you, ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Don't you, don't you think it'd be nice to have somebody love you? Amen. You know? Just, it's one of those things. And in verse 3, he says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. The hope of your calling is what keeps you together. Have you ever seen anybody come apart at the seams and sometimes it's happen it happens with people all the time and uh, you hear it in uh, the the hospitals when they're having babies <laughs> they don't want to talk about anything else okay except to look to their husband and say you did this to me <laughs> you know no that's not it. <laughs> Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. The problem is people don't understand what the calling is. But it's, it's dedicated here in verse 2 and 3. He says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Boy, that's comforting to me. I'm in Christ. I don't have to worry about that anymore. I don't worry about dying. I don't worry about that kind of thing because it's going to happen anyway. All right, so you might as well get ready. But the thing is, if you're not ready, what happens? You don't ever come back. And I would never want to go to where that place is. Hell is not a good place. And the hope of your calling is not for you to focus on yourself. It's the calling that leads you out into the world to reach people and get them saved. There is a promise of life. Uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 8. 
It says, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. And that's true, every bit of it. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. You see that? That's a promise. And that promise of life means that you're going to get what God said he was going to give you when you believe the gospel. Amen. People get saved and then they forget a lot of stuff and then they don't know what to do. Sometimes it happens when you get older. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the way it is, right? And you, you look at it, you have to look at it twice. <laughs> and find it three times. But the, the problem is that the, this promise of life, it brings hope to us. And that is a wonderful thing. Okay? It's fantastic. In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, this the promise of the life that now is. Now, go to verse 9 with me. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God. There are so many gods in the world, you, can't, you just can't figure them out. And who would want to? The living God is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So what do you do and understand uh, when you're trying to understand something? You, you get comfort. You get help inside. You're not always as, as wonderful as you think you are. But he says in verse 13, Till I come, give attendance to reading exhortation and doctrine you do that all the time as much as you can get till I come give attendance to reading to exhortation to doctrine neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery mediate on these things Give thyself wholly to them. That's not H-O-L-Y. That's completely. It's, it means completely, wholly to them. That thy profiting may appear to all. Now that's not bad to be appearing to all. Because, you know, people, that's how people get together and they learn about the gospel. If you look at Christianity... It's been slowly morphing and melting into churchianity. You got that? You go into any church and sit down and it's going to be fine if that's what you're known to do. But when you begin to talk about other things that they don't understand, what's the problem? <laughs> Sin, death, and judgment more than likely. The, the hope of your calling and this promise of life is wonderful because now you're being told and, and it's like he's, he's still treating you as a child because that's what we are. We're his children in the sense, but you know, these things are built up so that these things, look at verse 11. Um... First Timothy, uh, let's go, wait a minute, uh, 4, uh, 11. He says, I'll read 10 with you. Uh, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. And what does he say in verse 11? These things command and teach. You don't have the right to not teach when you know you can teach. Teachers do it all the time. They go teach all day long, then they go home, they don't want to teach anymore. Well, that's what, that's what their vocation is. So what is your vocation? 
What is it in you that makes you want to be a teacher? Up to that point, it's okay. But when you start saying the word Bible, then what happens? They don't want to hear it. I spent 30 years in my own business giving people the gospel. And I, I, I went through some things that <laughs> boggle your mind, okay? I started putting up uh, t-shirts that said, Christ died for our sins, and I put it right behind the counter. And people walk in, and they, they didn't bother them. Uh, I had people coming there to get their stuff fixed and so forth, and I had a guy come in, and he was walking real slow, like this. And he walks up, and he, he takes his cane, and he he takes it and he pokes that shirt that was hanging there. Pokes. And he goes, huh. 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 That's all I could say. I never got one word out of him. <laughs> and I thought, I think he's Jewish. And I looked at him and, and I, I said, how you doing? And he didn't want to talk to me. He just, I don't know why he was there, but he, he was there. And I thought about it, and my son is in the back helping me, and he's laughing about this thing. And I thought, you know, I'm, I feel sorry for this guy, because he's not on the right track. And when you, when you die and, and, and leave your body, it's not going up, that's for sure, if you don't believe that Christ died for your sins. Uh, it's a fantastic part of life for me. And these things command and teach. That's what he says. There are some issues that can be helpful. And I've been working on some things in different parts of Paul's epistles because they're, they're, they're fascinating for me. And I, I enjoy reading them and studying them and, and trying to really figure them out. And I, I made a list of things here, kind of a short list, about establishing authority. Not, not uh, you know, people in the world that are police or you know government or any of that. I'm talking about a higher authority. The higher authority. In Acts chapter 9 verse 15, Paul was chosen, it was a chosen vessel of God. And in 1 Corinthians 14, in verse 37, he says, if any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Pauline authority is everything if you're going to use the Pauline epistles. That's what it is. I, I've had people talk to me about, the, the, they get mixed up in their mind about Matthew and Mark and Luke and John even into the early Acts. And then things go haywire because they don't seem to jive. You say, yeah, they don't jive. That's the problem. For them, it's a problem. But as you see the, the chart and the way it works, it's great. You, you've got 2,500 years from Adam to Moses. You've got 1,500 years uh, from Moses to Christ. And now, right here, in the dispensation of grace, what do we do? We don't know when it's going to end, do we? I like that idea. <laughs> I don't want to see a calendar with my name on it. Okay? The idea is that he has done so much as one man that it has really been a tremendous bounty he is filling up the body of Christ. That's what he's doing. 
He's made a minister and a witness to God. Go over to Acts 26. There's a lot of people that are really normal, wonderful people. And go to Acts 26. But they get confused with the churchianity. And they don't know what to do. And they, they, get, they get into this. And the reason that they can't break away from it, and some of them do, but when they can't break away from it, it's always because family doesn't always agree with you. Right? And if you break away, what happens? There's separation. And then there's this long no talking section. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you realize that they don't quite understand this. Let me say this clearly. The, the idea of the Apostle Paul being the only apostle that you should ever know first. Now you can listen and, and read to, in the other books about the other apostles, but they have their 12 apostles. A couple of them died and so forth, and, and they bring more on. But in, in the Pauline epistles, there, there's just one apostle. Why? Because there's one body. And it's part of that. Uh, in Acts 26, verse 16, uh, I'm going to start here in uh, verse 15. He says, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? <laughs> he's, re he's revitalizing and, and re, uh, you know, visiting what had happened. I don't know how many times he talked about this in his life, about that day, falling off the horse. And you think he's going to say something really kind of strange, you know? Like verse 14, he says, And when they were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard to kick against the pricks. And, and I said, Who art thou? <laughs> Who does that to God? When he hasn't even said hi. I had, he says, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And I'm thinking, well, maybe he didn't like the idea that he was being told that he was persecuting God, the creator of heaven and earth. This is a little bitty ant, and he's a great big giant, and I don't understand why he took it on. He says, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. There you go. You got your marching orders. Get your uniform on and let's go. Because delivering thee, he says, from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes. You know what? The dispensation of grace has mo opened up more Christian eyes than anywhere. Delivering me, he says, from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You know, Satan's worried here. <laughs> yep. The darkness to the light and from the power of Satan where? Unto God. 
There are so many things that you can overcome by just reading and studying and listening and talking about it and writing about it. We got all kinds of materials over there on the, on the tables. And you get to this thing and, and, it, and it seems like he was having some problems. Well, this is all really the same thing. In, in other words, Acts 9 and then in Acts 22, you see him in the temple in a trance. And then here in the end of Acts, you see him talking about these other things. And he's talking to King Agrippa here in verse 19. He says, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed, them, uh, showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works for repentance. This is kind of a honeymoon thing going on here. The, the, he doesn't really understand fully. And by this time he does. But it's all about the idea of bringing something new. And the, the newness of it is the power because we now have something that we don't have to worry about when it comes to saying, are you a Jew or a Gentile? Forget it. There's no, there's no necessity to it. Every single person that lives in this world is going to die. And most of them already have. And as a result, you know, it keeps on coming. This is an important thing. And I, I, I think it's interesting that, that the dispensation of grace is really an open-ended thing. We just don't know. It's not a thing that you can count for. Say, okay, when it gets to this, that's when we're going. It doesn't happen that way. The body of Christ is going, and nobody's going to stop it. But Satan can stop it if you're not saved. And he will, too, as much as possible. The, 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 uh, the establishing of Pauline authority really solidifies the whole concept of the body of Christ and what is really going to be taken care of by him coming and get, getting us. He descends from heaven with a shout and all these things start going on and there are people trying to emulate these kind of things. They want to make religions out of these kind of things. Yeah, it's terrible. And, and it mixes so many people up. Uh, I used to do a lot of work in churches with audio, and I, I would talk to the pastors. And I was in this place, and these guys were in a Church of Christ uh, venue. And uh, I was sitting there, and uh, we were talking, and, and I, I was just there that evening I, as a kind of a thing to do to talk to some of these people. I'd already talked to some of them, and so uh, we kind of got into a tiff about some things. They started, you know, trying to tell me that I was lost and that I'm going to go to hell and all this stuff. Now, I'm just sitting there in the pew. I didn't do anything. I just stood up, and then a whole bunch of these guys got around me. And uh, the kids were running out of the car. Mom's in the car, and the dads are in there. And, and they, they send the kids in to try to get, get Dad out, you know. And they're, they're tired of sitting in the parking lot. I'm, I'm just sitting there listening to them. I had a couple of people in that church that w I went to school with. And so finally, the pastor came out and he said, and he took me down to his office and shut the door. <laughs> and we talked for two and a half hours. And you know what the guy told me? He says, I'm not a Church of Christ. <laughs> he said, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> 
And I said, well, why are you preaching in a church of Christ? And I said, man, that's weird. What are you doing? He said, well, I needed the money. And that money was not good money. <laughs> that's a horrible thing. And so you, I learned some stuff just working around that church. It was freaky. I had never actually seen a baptism before or a baptismal. And uh, I walked up there and I looked in that thing and uh, it had been messed up. Uh, the, the pump was failing or something and it was nasty. <laughs> I walk up, I go, what do you guys do with that? <laughs> Oh, we're trying to get it fixed. I said, well, <laughs> man, I wouldn't come here if that was doing that because, man, that thing was bad news. And uh, so <laughs> I, I, I just, I couldn't handle it. I, I said, well, maybe you'll get that fixed before I come back and finish up this job. <laughs> they, I, I couldn't believe that that guy was a Baptist. It, it, it was on my mind for weeks. And I went down and saw him again a couple more times and he was okay, but he wasn't really on board with these people. And they didn't even know it. Yeah. They did not know it. They don't. <laughs> they don't know it. And so, you know, that's the way it goes. Uh, let's go over to uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And I'm, I'm interested in the Pauline authority. I'm interested in the... the the fact that my apostle has all of us, all of us, the, the things that, that we need, they're here, right here, in these 13 epistles. I had a guy, we were talking about this at camp, and the guys at camp, we were discussing some of this, and I went back and I was talking to another guy about it and we talked about some of our discussions. And uh, what happened was, uh, it, was it was kind of strange because he, was, he wasn't really sure himself on what he was doing. And I sat down with him and I said, look, I want to give you some information about authority, okay? The Pauline epistles are if you want to think of it like this, those 13 epistles are Christianity. There is no Christianity anywhere else in this book. Now there are some segues going into that in Acts. But you know, you see Peter and all the other guys, what are they doing? It's over for them, right? And Paul... When, when he's talking to the people that he was meeting and talking to, and, they, and, and he knew who they were, you know what they did? <laughs> the only thing they could do. We're going to stop being this, and we're going to follow you. And, th and that, was a, that was a kind of a, a, an icebreaker for me, because I thought that they would just go out and flitter away and die. They didn't. So when you see this, you say, What's, what are we doing now? Can we join with you? <laughs> they were first called Christians at Antioch. And there were many people that did not claim the title of a Christian, but they were ready to continue to help Paul. Romans 1.1 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, period, which he had promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, by whom we have received grace and what? He got the grace and he got the apostleship. He got the job, okay? And nobody's ever going to take it away from him. 
He says, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I was in uh, Sicily with my, uh, my wife and my son and uh, his wife and his little baby. They're living, uh, the, lo they're living the, the great life because it was a beautiful place. I mean, you think about Sicily being kind of clunky because all the, the mobsters live there. <laughs> but it's not really true. That's just on one corner of it, you know? So I, I, we were thinking about some of this stuff and, and all the people that he knew, I mean, my, my son is living in a villa, okay, with a pool and all this stuff. And I thought he was gonna be living in a shack. You know, I didn't know what was going on. I'd never been to Sicily before. So we started driving all over Sicily. And when we got around to it, there's a, uh, a place called Mount Etna. And we were sitting in the, we were having a 4th of July party at the uh, house there. And that thing started booming like you would not believe, okay? It's there. On Sicily, there's all these big giant rolling kind of humps that were all coming down from Mount Etna in about 1600, 16, uh, you know, a few hundred years there, a couple hundred years. And so all this stuff just sitting there, you know, you can't do anything with it. It's just rock. And so we went up there and we were going to go see Etna. And I said, yeah, I want to go. And we got up there and I saw these big buses, okay, and they had full-size tractor ta trails, uh, tires on them, okay, and you had to go up these inclines because the only thing that was there were little chunks of this stuff that comes out of the, uh, out of the uh, Mount Etna and, and all of a sudden you look around and there's nothing but that stuff. You're just in it and it's hundreds and hundreds of feet high and I'm thinking, man, this is weird. Look at this and, and this stuff is blowing it out the top and it's the, it's the most active uh, volcano in the all, all of Europe. And that thing just, it just burps it out like crazy. And when we got over there, I walked over to the edge of the, where the water was, and I looked down on the water and I saw a perfectly formed boot of Italy. And I thought, whoa, that's beautiful. And so when you start to meet the people and you start to learn the culture a little bit and you start to, to learn their history and all that, it was a lot of fun. And we stayed over there for about three weeks and we had a blast. Even went to Rome, did some other things. We had fun doing that until we got to Rome. Rome was good. I mean, I didn't have any trouble with it. But some of the things that I walked into, I did not want to walk into any more of them because they have some pretty freaky buildings <laughs> that you go in. And, and it's, it's, it, to me, it's like, it's, it's satanic. The Pantheon, they, they redid it. And in the middle of the Pantheon, there's a big giant hole. Okay, I mean, it's like, I don't know how many, it's bigger in this room, okay? And then there's a hole in the, in the ceiling. And so when it rains, it just rains on that big circle. It's the weirdest stuff. But they had so many things in Rome, and they're still doing it, that when you walk into it, you just go, ooh, this is creepy. Because you know the difference between what that was and what they were doing with it. Now, they're just trying to keep it all together. The, the problem is, is they don't have any authority. We lost another pope, right? 
And what are you going to do? There is no authority. He's dead. And now there's another one's going to come, and he's going to be dead, and it just keeps going. He is the quin. He he's the quintessential apostle. He is your apostle. If you want to go see an apostle, go see Paul. And that happens in the thirteen epistles that he left us. And there is more true understanding of what we need than any other thing in the Bible. Now I like reading all through my Bible. I love it. It's fun. And I learn from it. But it's like anything else. Sometimes you've got to run home to mama. And it's, it's interesting because I was walking around amongst a bunch of people that were all connected to, the, to this thing in Rome. All of Italy and, and Sicily. And so when I, that was one of the most incredible trips I've ever been on. And it, it kind of gave me an opportunity to think about things a, a little different way. Because really, if you're in a place like that, you're walking around amongst a lot of people that really have no clue where they're going to go. When you see them doing this, and all of this, this stuff that they do, you, you have to be compassionate. compassionate. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Because they, they, don't, they don't know it. They don't understand it. And they've got all this stuff around them. They own it all. And yet, they're all going to the same place. But they can get saved. And I tell you, I, 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 really, I really believe that, that establishing the Pauline authority is, is something that, that literally drives us to some of the things that we need to understand, okay? One of these is the hope of our calling, which we've been talking about, and the promise of life, and this whole thing about it being something to teach. And Paul says these things command and teach. In 2 Timothy 1, when Paul says, Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. I'm comfortable with that. I love that. That's truth. It can't be changed. He said it. Yeah, 2 Timothy 1 and 1 to 14. And Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, I'm skipping around a little bit, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Our comfort of hope is very important. And I want to give you just a little bit of this because uh, go to uh, Romans chapter 15 and go to verse 4. I like, I like being near to the, the, the things that I like to read. And even though I might read something that you might not read, that's okay but when you start reading things and really soak it up, it's really, it's really a, a wonderful thing. Okay. Uh, Romans 15, verse 4. And I'm just going to start with verse 1. <clears throat> he says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. I wonder what the ratio is in here about the strength and the weak, the infirmities, and so forth. And not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. 
For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. And that's Paul telling us. He says that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. I love that. Go down to verse 13. This is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy. With all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. I can, I can go there anytime I want. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, notice this. He says, I love the book of Colossians. It's fantastic. What these guys were doing, fantastic. Epaphras, Philemon, Onesimus, the slave. The, these guys were with Paul all the way. The, uh, the thing begins here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope of which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Now notice verse 6. Which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the, what? The day ye heard of it, and knew what? That's right. That's on the program this week. That is true. Just like everything else. The day ye heard of it and, sh and knew the grace of God in truth. The Lord Jesus Christ does not spew anything other than truth. He speaks and he knows what he's doing about it. He says in, in verse 7, he says, As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. And now we go into the prayer. He says in verse 9, he says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's attainable. It's attainable. If you can't, if you don't believe it's not attainable, then just keep reading it and you'll figure it out. Because he says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord in all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There is no end to the knowledge of God. You can't, you can't reach that far. He says, strengthened with all might according in his glorious power, to his glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. What a prayer this is. It's interesting. C giving thanks unto the Father, 
which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You don't just get it because you think you deserve it. That's not how it works. We give thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of that inheritance. You have to get it. And it's only a switch. I believe it. Now, I've seen people all over the place coming in and out of my group and they have no idea what in the world we're doing. I said, we're having fun. I don't know about you, but we're reading these things and we're talking about these things and we're teaching these things and what happens is you, you end up, you go, we got to stop. We got to talk about this because if you, if you don't really understand this, then you're going to have to go home and read this book a, l a couple of times, maybe four or five, because, and, and, and that's, that, that's not really enough, but I, I'm just saying to you, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That kingdom is the body of Christ in the heavenly places, and I'm going. Verse 14. He says in verse 14, he says, In whom we have redemption, through his blood, yeah. Even the forgiveness of sins. You know, people can't forgive each other for little things. How are they going to forgive you your sins? They don't want to do that. He says, who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature... For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be, thr uh, be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Now you know who you're with. You're with him. When you get saved, you're in Christ. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Go down to verse 27, and, it, and we'll, we'll stop in, in this. He says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is no longer a mystery to us, is it? Among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The gospel of our hope, the, the comfort of our hope, the promise and life of our hope, this hope of our calling is all to, to build us up, not tear us down. And this hope is always going to be there for you because it's true. He says, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily, he says. I believe it. Have you ever seen anybody throw their hands up? <laughs> Say, oh, I don't want to, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. And today they just do it anyway. But... They don't even have a chance, you know. I don't care what they're doing. <laughs> Robbing a grocery store, I don't care what it is. But you need to have some understanding about where you're going to go. And I believe that people that understand this and, and understand the hope and understand the things that we have, they'll, they'll go gladly to heaven. To save somebody's life. Amen. 
Okay, we'll do one more. Let's do one more. Gospel of our hope. I was listening to the brother today. He did a great job. Uh, it was really good. And in Ephesians, or uh, in Romans chapter 3, let's go over there. Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, verse 9, there is a final verdict. And what is the final verdict? The whole world's guilty before God, right? Yeah, that's it. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, not one, that there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. These are normal everyday people, okay? It's been going on for centuries. All of this information that we're getting now is trying to, to, to just get everybody on board. Get as many people saved as you can. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. In verse 19, skip down there to verse 19. He says, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, I want to tell you that anytime you come, and I know all of you probably know this, <laughs> but uh, when you see the word, but now, or but God, you better, you better look good because he's going to give you something that's very important to your salvation process. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. God was involved in forbearing all of these things, and it's been part of his way of doing things. He says, verse 26, he says, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? I don't hear anybody boasting about it. Nobody's running down the aisle. Nobody's trying to get some, some sort of thing in. Where is the boasting? He says it's excluded. It's not necessary. <laughs> he says... By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of what? Faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Do you have to work for it now? No. You can only believe it once. That's it. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you today for this gathering we thank you all for being here and we thank you for all the opportunities that have been given here today and yesterday we appreciate this and and we need it we want to thank you today in christ amen